Thanks for coming back out after lunch, everybody. Uh, my name is Josh Huff. Uh, today's talk is about open source intelligence, or OSINT. Uh, it's called What I Learned by Being an OSINT Creeper. Uh, it's not a highly technical talk. Uh, one of the creepiest things about open source intelligence is the fact that anybody can really do it. Um, so we'll get started. Uh, one of the first things we do is define uh, what OSINT is. Um, this is a variation of the military definition, um, and it consists of two things. Uh, what OSINT is and the discipline itself of how you acquire it. Um, OSINT is publicly available information. It could be just about anything that is out there um, that you can get for free. The library, uh, stuff on the internet, a sign that's posted on the front of a uh, storefront window. Um, the intelligence discipline uh, is how you acquire it and it's defined as intelligence produced from publicly available information that is collected, exploited, and reported to address a specific intelligence requirement. Uh, now, it's a highly tactical definition, uh, but it's one that I enjoy because of what I do. Um, this is me. Uh, I work for Stillinger Investigations, or a private investigation firm in Columbia, South Carolina, and I do the digital forensics there. Uh, in the lab, uh, most days I'm going to have a full computer hard drive image or a cell phone image, and those are just complete open books of, of people's lives in front of me. Uh, everybody keeps just about everything on their cell phone anymore. Um, so that tactical definition uh, keeps me in check. You know, I have a specific goal that I'm exploring around in this thing. I'm not just being a creep and, and prying around in somebody's lives. Um, so again, tactical definition, but it really works for what I do. Um, some things that uh, other groups would be interested in for open source intelligence gathering, uh, government and military. Obviously, there's uh, foreign intelligence that's important, uh, getting into terrorism and politics. Uh, law, we're going to have court documents, arrest records, uh, inmate and prisoner records. Businesses going to be interested in copyright information, financial reporting, competition, marketing. Um, and then in security, you know, the red team is going to be looking for network structures, account enumeration, IP addresses, SSIDs. Um, then you get into the personal stuff, uh, addresses, date of birth, who you work for, who your family is. Um, that's the creepy stuff. Uh, that's what I'm going to cover mostly today. Uh, before we go into exercises, really, a uh, quick uh, thought on ethics and OSINT. Uh, this definition uh, I pulled from a uh, developer in the UK named Michael. He gave me permission to use it from his blog. Uh, he says, OSINT is about examining information and data that's public, and it should not involve invasions of privacy. A legitimate researcher must know where the line is drawn between OSINT and espionage. The latter including stuff like eliciting information, actual illegal network penetration, and eavesdropping. In other words, things that haven't proactively been made public. Um, working for a private investigator, um, we're regulated by South Carolina Law Enforcement Division. Uh, so walking an ethical line is something that we have to do. Um, once you get good at this stuff, though, uh, disclaimer one, don't be a creep. You know, if, if you get the ability to, to find out information, personal stuff about people, um, there's a difference for doing it for an intelligence tactical reason, like the definition says, and just being a snoopy jerk. Don't do that. One of the first uh, exercises I like to uh, talk about is just to help you kind of develop an OSINT mindset. Uh, this picture came from Facebook last year. Um, I think the caption read something to the fact of, check out this sweet deal at tar uh, Kroger, Kroger Gas. Uh, so take a look at it and notice what the account owner wants you to see. 78 cents a gallon, they just got a sweet deal. I'm going to take a snapshot, brag about it to all my friends. What I want you to see, they just put 25 and a half gallons of gas into something. You know, you can pull a, a couple inferences and maybe say it's a truck or an SUV, you know, larger vehicle right off of that. Second thing I want you to notice, the background. Pull it up a little bit stronger. You can't quite make out the person to identify them, uh, but there's some key identifiers of the, the vehicle there. Um, kind of that circular half moon uh, of the tail light you can see. You can also see that it is, is actually a, a larger vehicle. So, you know, SUV, truck, minivan, something like that. So we can do a couple things there. Uh, hit up a Google search for an SUV tail light. You know, the, the half moon shape that I'm looking for is close on a few of these things, but no cigar. So we'll refine the search just a little bit. Maybe it's not a uh, late model vehicle. Used SUV tail light. 
I think the uh, fifth one over on the uh, top row is the one that ends up hitting pay dirt. It's a dead match. You click on that guy, and it's a Dodge Durango 2004 to 2009. So you've gone and identified the, the make and model in a pretty close range of years to, to check into. Where do we go next? Um, you check cars.com, uh, Craigslist, public records, arrest records, basically news articles, anything that might give you some, some more clues to, to drill into about that particular type of vehicle. Um, coming from Facebook, you probably know slightly about what region it came from as well. Um, people.com, that's them, and Spokio are, are really excellent people searches that you can get some, some decent information out of before you get to their paywalls. Um, also a great way to, to go. Now, that example produced unintentional OSINT. This is what I call unintelligent OSINT. <laughs> Check out the sweet selfie on my, my new debit card. Um, and we recover the first four digits for security, right? So let's talk about issue identifier, num identifier numbers. A uh, couple of websites out there that have really well laid out listings of what banks use for the first couple of digits and as well as uh, regional identifiers that tell you, you know, almost how to get the first six digits of, of most cards with a little bit of, of insight there. Uh, the LUN algorithm, you can uh, plug numbers into that and it will run a checksum that tells you whether or not it's actually a valid number. Um, in that case, the, the first number was a four because it was a visa and then you only had three more numbers to figure out. The LUN algorithm helped you eliminate about 90% more of those um, very quickly with math. Um, is this OSINT? Not exactly. I just like the example. Um, we're taking known or given information. We're going to apply knowledge or uh, tools and produce intelligence. So it makes a good, uh, good example. Um, doing these exercises, I started to finally drill out, you know, what was the methodology that I was following from, you know, kind of a case-by-case -case basis. So this is kind of what, what I do with mine. You're always going to start with your known items or data points, um, whatever is given in, in the actual OSINT that's out there. And then go back to the definition. We're going to set an intelligence goal. What is our target data that we're going to try to get to? We'll get our tools that we're going to use to analyze the data and see how those data points are connected. Then we'll pivot using the new data points, get our tools together, gather, analyze, pivot, just repeat until you get to your target data. Once you've gotten to your target data, try to validate, is our data correct? There's a lot of interconnected information out there, so validation is very important or you will just spider web into um, nothingness sometimes that's completely unrelated. Now, methodology slide, people are sleepy, kind of boring one, so we'll rename it. OSINT Connect Dots, it's a little bit more fun, and we'll slap a good case study on it. This was uh, last year in October, a uh, road rage incident uh, happened in Columbia. Uh, two gentlemen in vehicles, uh, one guy pulls a gun and, and takes a shot at the other one, um, flees the scene. Surveillance footage captures a big bright phone number on the side of the vehicle that he was in. So, go back to OSINT Connect the Dots. We're going to start with our known items. In the news stories that they posted with that, uh, Crime Stoppers was looking for information. They provided us a name, Joseph Lamar Christmas II, age 39, the big bright green phone number from the truck, and ties to North Carolina and South Carolina cities. We'll set our target data. Let's get a picture of the guy that they didn't provide and uh, feed it to Crime Stoppers, right? Go to uh, people.com uh, was my first stop. Just plugged in um, the phone number from the truck as well as uh, South Carolina and immediately it pulls up a hit for Joseph Lamar Christmas, um, 73 years old. Uh, a couple of phone numbers, a couple of addresses and some associated uh, people. So we go to analyze that, put the old data next to the new data and, and look at it. Um, age difference, likely um, the target's father. You know, we've got some some new addresses and new phone numbers to play with. So we'd make some inferences off of that. Like I said, possibly the target's father. Phone number on the truck brings up the father and not the target. So maybe we're looking at a family business. It was a uh, landscaping truck, I believe. Um, so we decide let's look up the family a little bit. 
get some tools together. Um, this is uh, Mike Bazell's IntelTechniques.com. Uh, I, I lean to this website quite a bit if there's uh, social media uh, searching that I'm, that I'm doing. Um, this slide shows his uh, Facebook search tools. The, uh, the right side of the screen will help you locate a target's account on Facebook, and the left side is designed to help you dig into that account and find information on the target. So I quickly analyze with the right side and locate every single one of the associated people from the uh, people search um, and find their pages. Analyze those a little bit and it's, it's all family members. Um, there's no apparent account for Joseph Lamar Christmas II. So we're gonna look into the, the family members a little bit, find the chatterbox in the family maybe. Eleanor, zero pictures. Jay, who is actually uh, Lamar Sr., um, zero pictures and a very uh, unused account. Mary, 20 pictures. Jason, 27 pictures. Margaret, 235 pictures. Found her chatterbox. So I go back to the uh, search screen and hit the left side with uh, Margaret's account. Um, this side will take her Facebook user ID out of the URL, convert it to a Facebook uh, number, account number, and it's gonna run API searches against information. So I, I tag Joseph and Joe with her Facebook user ID number on a search on that left side, and we land on a whole bunch of photos that Margaret's thrown up. This is my brother Joe, this is my brother Joe and his girlfriend. So I'm happy, I found these two pictures, snapped the little profile off of it. How do we validate? Arrest made in Columbia Road Rage incident. It happened to be the, the same guy. Holy crap, I'm Batman. <laughs> All right, so quick common sense alert there. Don't leak your data online. You know, being in security and security enthusiasts, we're all aware of this. You know, be careful what settings are on your device, but don't let other people leak that data for you either. This guy didn't even have a Facebook account, but he's all over Facebook because of a sister. Now, before you go acting like a crime fighter, um, let's talk about a few things. You wanna cover your tracks. Uh, we all know that somebody's poking around on our LinkedIn account because we get the notifiers. Um, you're going to get friend recommendations through Facebook and Twitter if you start poking around looking at people's accounts. Um, so be aware of that. You're going to want to, especially if you're looking at criminals, protect who you are. Um, this website, fakenamegenerator.com, um, will make that process super easy. It gives you a complete profile, name, um, partial social security number, mother's maiden name, job, what city you came from as well as an email um, burner account that is actually usable. Um, you can take that and, and register for other accounts on the fly. So you've protected who you are at that point. Protect where you're coming from. Um, Tor, Tails, uh, virtual private networks, and virtual machines are excellent ways to take some of those steps. Um, Tails is a live USB operating system. Um, it automatically runs all its network through uh, Tor. Um, it's preloaded with privacy and encryption tools, and when you shut it down and, and take it off your host machine, it wipes the RAM on shutdown. Um, being a forensic analyst, that is really cool and, and neat to see. Um, it is also a completely free tool. Um, their website's set up with a, uh, a easy to follow um, how-to to make the, uh, the live CD and it also has a lot of good privacy information about what it's trying to protect you from. It's definitely worth a read. All right, talking about tools, um, OSINTframework.com is one that I also lean to quite a bit. Um, it is set up with about, I think, 31 starting points on the left side there. We're talking about phone numbers, address, uh, email, domains, uh, maps, social media, a little bit of everything. If you have a starting point uh, for your OSINT, um, you can find a category that you can jump into, and it's going to give you probably five or six tools that you can uh, lean on to, to pivot off of that, that first information. Intel Techniques, I mentioned this one earlier. Um, there's more than just the uh, Facebook search tools on there. It is a uh, highly 
useful website. Go check out the, um, there's a tutorial on this main page. It's about 70 minutes. It talks about um, how to use the, the Facebook tools that I was using in that first example um, pretty in depth. It gives you a lot, lot bigger uh, learning experience on that. It is not. He has paid lessons, um, but all the tools on that link set are completely free. The reason I like both of those tool sets the most is because I call OSINT basically the land of dead tools. Uh, once you start going through and, and bookmarking all the, these awesome open source sites that you can use to, to gather intelligence, um, you're going to find obsolescence. Uh, changes in the online landscape are going to create you know, different uh, security, um, privacy updates from the, the web, websites themselves. Um, you're going to get API changes, uh, transitions to paid business models for the sites that are doing very well, uh, company acquisitions that just you know, shut something down or you know, maybe make it a paid site, um, and then just abandoned projects. You know, there's a lot of open source stuff out there that we try to share with our peers and our friends and you know we get busy or pulled into a new career and those guys just go by the wayside. Um, the uh, one of the big examples of a recent sort of recent API change was Instagram I think back in June they went through a big change and it knocked off Iconosquare which is an excellent uh, search tool um, to go through and, and get um, Instagram accounts that had geotagging and uh, once that went away um, Iconosquare went to a paid only, and a lot of the other tools in that kind of realm uh, just kind of disappeared. As far as uh, following uh, some of the field leaders right now, these are the probably the four uh, guys I would pay attention to if you want to get into uh, OSINT and a, a more in-depth level. Uh, Mike Bazell, who we've talked about a bunch of times, he, uh, he updates that website with a, a monthly mailer that tells you basically what he's seen as far as the API changes and what has become irrelevant, um, what he's fixed and what he's just dropped because it doesn't work anymore. Um, so every month he shoots out a, an update on, on some of his tools and the status of things on that site. Uh, again, all that stuff is completely free. Um, Justin Seitz, uh, he runs a blog, Automating OSINT. Um, he's also got a paid program called Hunchly that's pretty valuable, um, but it's behind the uh, licensing. Um, automating OSINT, he does a lot of automation with uh, Python um, to gather a lot of the, the OSINT stuff that I'm doing manually. Um, it's definitely worth a look if you want to go to the advanced side of that if you're into uh, to, uh, programming. Um, Justin Nordin, uh, he's the one that runs the OSINT framework. Um, he's very open to suggestions and recommendations to tools. If you found something, um, he'll add it into the framework. If you're using something from the framework and it's no good anymore, he's, he's taking notes and uh, he'll knock them off there on the next update. Um, I think he pushed out an update probably within the last three weeks or so. Um, and he flags it on uh, GitHub and, and Twitter so you can get a hold of him on there and keep tabs on that. Uh, Micah Hoffman, uh, SANS instructor. He's got a website, webbreacher.com, with a decent amount of uh, OSINT talks. Um, blog examples of, of different, you know, tactics that are out there. Um, again, all, all free stuff from Micah. All right, we'll get into a few more uh, examples because that's the, uh, the fun stuff, really. Um, reviewing the stuff that I've done over the, the last year, I realized that I like doing geolocation a lot. Um, so a lot of these are just tracking stuff down based on what's, what's out there online. It's a, a lot of fun. And you kind of see it in everything once you get good at it. Um, you, you see something on TV or, or a selfie, and you're like, no, 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 there's too much information in that. <clears throat> but here's a couple examples. Property data. Um, this is something that's uh, linked in on the, the OSINT framework. Um, public records will take you to a Melissa Data website, and it'll tell you about uh, property uh, data, public record stuff that's on file with the property. Um, so. I like to say, do a search for the places I'm giving the talk. You know, what's it say about the building that we're in right now? Actually, nothing, which floored me. That's the first time that I've plugged in an address and got nothing from that search. Um, tried to make a couple of inferences and researches. I think it has to do with maybe some of the historic zoning or, or you know, the way that Charleston handles public record, possibly. If so, good for them. Um, so I plugged in last year's venue at the Tides. This is a little bit more what you're used to seeing. You get some property information on, on market value, square footage, you know, that kind of stuff. But still, business information, no data. So again, really surprised by that. I gave this talk at uh, DerbyCon in the Hyatt in Louisville, 
gives you quite a bit. You know, you've got a, a phone number contact for the, the hotel, you've got approximate number of employees there, um, sales figures, the property owner, so you've got a tie-in out in Chicago um, with a business name, um, as well as quite a bit of stats on the, the building again. I would highly recommend that you check that site out and plug in your own address to make sure that uh, you don't have a good starting point on your own uh, home um, saying some stuff about you. You can find uh, phone numbers, emails, um, quite often on it. Uh, it's Melissa data. Yep, uh, it's, it's linked in off of the, uh, the OSINT framework, uh, but they've got a bunch of different search tools right through that site. Using Shodan, we're all familiar with the, the wide open webcams that you can find out there. Um, this one was an IP address that located out in Texas. Um, it was definitely not a good one because the, the webcam was one of those pivoting ones, and that is a point of sale system down in the bottom of the frame, and you could totally see what was going on on that thing. Do a quick Google search for the uh, sign that you can see through the, uh, the window there um, for you fix it, and you got four locations in Texas. Real easy to head over to Google Maps and find the one that matches that picture. Then you've got a, a full address there. Walking Dead. This example was fun. I uh, I got a, went to a, a concert in Atlanta um, a couple years ago with my wife, and the episode that came up on on that uh, weekend when we got back, um, I was like, man, that that structure in the back that looks real familiar, you know. So I pulled up some. Uh, some information on Google Earth. Yeah, there was a tent, tent zombies. No spoilers though. Google Earth, I go back to the area that we stayed in and just started cruising from the hotel to the concert venue that we walked through. And uh, real easy, I found the same parking structure in that, that skywalk and it was filmed at 163 Carnegie Way. So um, that's one of those just attention to detail things. It, it struck me as funny and I was like, oh yeah, that's totally the exact address that this was filmed at. So just kind of a random example there. More geolocation. Um, this is a shopping blog. I think it's ratherbeshopping.com. Um, somebody's taking a picture of like the Walmart app, cell phone picture with a cell phone snap. Metadata. Um, linking through the, the OSINT framework again, clicking on images, going to metadata. Uh, Jeffrey's exit viewer. We take that picture and plug it in there, and we're going to actually get the specs of the, the cell phone that it was taken with. Um, time and date stamps, GPS coordinates, uh, approximate address based off of the, uh, those coordinates. And the thing I love the most is that angle down there. That's the orientation that the phone was, was pointed at when that picture was snapped. Posted online for, for all to see. So try to validate some findings there. Go to uh, Google Maps find the address, invert the uh, picture, and that's kind of a dead match to that guy's front door and front window there. Um, side note, um, metadata gets scrubbed by quite a bit of uh, the, the commercial websites. If you're using like Squarespace or something, they, they do a pretty good job of pulling that out for you. Uh, but this is obviously somebody that kind of did a DIY uh, web hosting deal. One of the dangers of doing that is uh, who is lookups. If you don't uh, create a private domain registration, all that information is, is absolutely just pulled out of the URL with the who is lookup as well. All the, uh, all the links uh, and examples, and uh, I've got a bunch of blogs and kind of further down the rabbit hole stuff um, is on my, my website, learnallthethings.net slash creepyosint. And uh, it will not find anything if you plug it into who is. <laughs> so don't try. Um, if you guys have any uh, questions or examples of uh, OSINT that you have found, I am definitely interested. So shoot me an email. You can find me on Twitter, at Beowulf88. Um, and I'm going to keep updating the, the links on this slide uh, series because um, I've gotten some really good feedback after these talks and, and added a few things. Um, do you guys have any, any questions? Just a comment, uh, Mike Pazell has also got a good podcast that he's been doing here uh, with the guy that uh, he wrote the book with, Privacy and Security. It's on about episode four now, but it's a privacy and security based podcast. It's yep. Really good. Yeah, that's basically the, the opposite side of, of what I just talked about on Sidebar. If you didn't catch Ralph's talk at, at noon, it is an excellent talk. I would highly recommend going and catching the recording because it's the other side of, of OSINT and how you protect yourself from, from getting this information out there. 
and that web series is definitely on my to-do list. It's only, like you said, four episodes in. Yeah, um, those guys have some good stuff. That's good. Yeah. Do you have a question? Yeah, uh, earlier when you showed that picture of the gas pump, what was the context for that? Um, it was just a Facebook post. Uh, somebody threw it up online and said, you know, hey, check out this sweet deal I got at, at Kroger. You know, and it is just an example to, to, you know, get you thinking, you know, that's just an innocent post that somebody threw up for their friends, not on a private, you know, Facebook account. That's the kind of stuff that you can pull out of things like that. Again, un unintentional, though, yeah. yeah. Aside from, like, the Basil folks and uh, Johnny Long, are there any other recommended reading you throw out there? Um, Basil's book is, is definitely on there. It's, it's, there's a lot of material in there. Um, if you check my um, the link that I've got, I've got a, a pretty good amount of, of blogs that I've read since I started researching OSINT. Um, and you'll just kind of stumble upon like a, a, a blog that blows you away. Like one of them is about um, reflection, uh, reconnaissance from <coughs> hotels. And uh, that link's on there. It, it, it was a, um, a band had tweeted some pictures on tour of you know kicking their feet up at in the hotel room. Oh, this is a sweet room, and the guy geolocated what hotel they were at based on uh, concert tours, and then he gave you a website. I think it's emporus.com that actually gives you uh, building statistics, and he was able to to find out like what floor they were in, and then with Google Earth and all that stuff, it was like yeah, you're in this room in this hotel, you know stuff like that. So. Um, I'll, I'll try to update that thing. I don't know a ton of other great recommended reads right now, but um, Bazell's book, um, you mentioned uh, Google Hacking, Johnny Long's book, excellent. Um, that's definitely one of those tools that, that you get into. Um, once you learn Google Hacking, a lot of these websites that, that you're using, especially like the, uh, the people APIs and stuff, you can do some manipulation with those URLs. Um, I just did a, a post um, on Twitter, uh, open source intelligence recently, and I, I talk about the sample API that they're using there will hit limits after a while, but you can go and register on people.com. They'll give you a, an API to use for free, and you just copy that API, drop it into the URL where the sample key is once it runs out, and it'll continue giving you full lookups. Any other questions? All right. Finished a little early, but thank you guys.